Okay. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending another one of our test uh, seminars. It's a real pleasure to have Steve Williams come up from our Townsville campus to talk to us today. Steve's a longstanding uh, member of TESS, and, and he's someone who's uh, we're looking forward to having contributions from him uh, further in the future. Um, Steve got his PhD here uh, at JCU. I remember him well. We knew each other, both mm -hmm. doing our field work about the same time. And he studied the ecology of rainforest vertebrates in the wet tropics. And then very soon after that, Steve could see, I think he was in some ways, well, I'm not sure prescient, but certainly could see that the issue of climate change was really going to increase in importance. And so he's really become one of the top researchers um, at JCU, which there's some very good researchers here working on climate change, but more on reefs. And Steve's taken a more terrestrial angle. Um, and he's been a, leading a very active group here. He founded the Center for Tropical Biodiversity and Climate Change, uh, and that's a center that's uh, done well, and he's uh, also been very active himself. He has more than 150 publications, and I saw closing in on something like 30,000 citations, so he's had a real impact, real impact. So we're very happy to have him here uh, talking to us about Global Climate Change, a code red alert for the Australian wet tropics in the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Um, for those of you who've seen me talk before, some of this material will be sort of familiar because I've been talking about it for 20 years now. Um, but I'll give you sort of the, um, the latest updates on the work that we've been doing in the last you know, couple of years and also um, how it fits into sort of, I guess, the increasing knowledge globally. Um, I, put, I put in you know, this code red alert. That's because that's basically how... Um, the latest IPCC sixth assessment report that came out just a couple of weeks ago has been described. Um, that report is now sort of, you know, I guess each successive IP, the predictions, unfortunately, are not changing, large impacts, and they're becoming sort of scarier and scarier. Um, and that's why I guess a lot of people describe the era that we're currently in as being the Anthropocene, the first time in the sort of history of the world where we, humans, are having an impact on the world that previously was only uh, possible through large geological events. And climate change is, is a very large part of what's driving, I guess, the impacts of the Anthropocene, and it's rapidly becoming the most serious threat to global biodiversity. So. The latest IPCC report, which came out, as I said, just a couple of weeks ago, um, is saying things like this now. It's unequivocal that it's the human influence. I mean, previous IPCC reports were sort of coming out statements saying, you know, oh, it's probably human influence. It's most likely human influence. Now they're just finally being completely and utterly positive. And there's lots of analyses and many, many thousands of scientists contributed to that. I mean, we're basically in a, in a period now that is warmer than it's been for 100,000 years. Um, there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than has been present for more than 2 million years. And it's just going to get hotter. That's the latest projections with the latest scenarios. And basically, we're looking at by about 2050, so only 30 years' time, we'll probably be up over 2 degrees of global warming. Now, keep Keeping that in mind, that's the sort of aim that we were trying to keep under with the Paris Accord. And in fact, the IPCC is coming out in more recent years saying really two degrees is not good enough, that we really need to keep it under 1.5. Now, that's just not going to happen. We're already at 1.2. Um, basically, temperature keeps going up. The last five years have been the five hottest years ever. Um, every year, we seem to break new records. And last year, globally, the temperature was already at 1.2 above um, the long-term average. So the, uh, that latest IPCC report has now come out with some fairly strong statements about and with higher degrees of certainty about those statements. And this is not predicting the future. This is observations now. Um, as I said, hotter than it has been for a long time. In actual fact... It would be about two degrees hotter already, except that by putting pollution into the atmosphere, we actually call global cooling by about 0.8 of a degree. And that's kind of almost saved us a little bit, um, which is you know, resulting in about 1.2 or so. There's now an observed 
slight increase in total global precipitation, which is not surprising. You get higher temperatures, you get more evaporation, you're going to get more precipitation. And ice in all of its forms around the world has declined on average now by about 40%, which is huge. Oceans are becoming more acidic, sea levels rising, and carbon dioxide is the highest it's been in at least 2 million years. So now they're coming out with statements like this um, about extremes. And I was very pleased to see in this latest IPCC report a much greater emphasis on extreme climate events, something we've been talking about in, I guess, you know, climate change impacts on biodiversity for a long time, that it's not the increase in average temperatures that actually has the impact, it's the increase in the extreme events. They've really recognised this in the latest report, and they're really saying that now there's evidence of observed changes in extremes, and it's directly attributed to human influence. So basically we've got um, more heat waves, more intense and more frequent. More high, heavy precipitation events, flooding rainfalls. Hey guys, you made it. <laughs> um, cyclones seem to have shifted a little bit towards the poles and increased in intensity. You can see there that that's got a lower confidence. Cyclones are pretty hard to predict. And the probability of extreme compounded effects has now been observed and has increased. And by compounded, it means like the sort of directly relating impacts. Things like, you know, you get heat waves are related to increased drought. Heat waves are also related to fires, rainfall and flooding. And as I said, this is something we've been saying for a long time now, but it's not what that does overall. So a small increase in the average, you get a very large increase in the extreme climates. So to recognise that the, this latest report, what they've done is rather than now just talking about global averages, they seem to have now compiled enough modelling and enough data from around the world to actually start focusing in on sort of smaller regions rather than it just being a global report, so to speak. And this is kind of like a stylized map of the world. There's Australia down here, um, sort of the Americas, and Europe and Africa. And they've sort of broken up the world into these hexagonal um, sort of regions. And in this case, what they're talking about is the effect of heat waves, observed heat waves. This is not predicted. And you can see that pretty much everywhere has experienced heat waves now. Um, and the little dots here indicate how confident they are about that. In other words, they're highly confident that those heat waves um, have been increasing, attributable to human climate change. With heavy rainfall, so this is sort of sort of rainfall that causes flooding. Rainfall, much harder to predict, much lower um, levels of certainty and reliability in the observations, there's so much variability. But you can see there are things happening. The green areas are areas where there's an observed increase in rainfall, and that includes right across northern Australia. The rest of Australia is kind of this grey area where there's just not enough agreement in the models to really be certain about what the, what the observations are telling us. But large parts of the world, more rainfall. Large parts of the world uh, have experienced observed increased uh, levels of drought, these dark brown areas. And again, lots of areas that it's uncertain. So in Australia, we've actually had a decrease in drought in the north and an increase in the south with a lot of uncertainty in the middle. Okay, so let's just have a look at um, Australia's recent climate, the last say, two years, basically. Well, we, last year we had a hottest year on record, even though 2020 wasn't the hottest year globally, it was the hottest in Australia, and it was 1.52 above long-term average. And that applied in every state, and we're talking about mean temperatures, maximum temperatures, and minimum temperatures. So it was universal. And in fact, our, our maximum temperature was two degrees above the long-term average. So, you know, we're talking about keeping temperatures below two degrees. In terms of maximum temperatures in Australia, we've already gone past that. We had significant extreme heat waves over the last two years. We've had significant droughts. We've had flooding rains above average. We've had huge areas affected by drought. And, of course, um, very catastrophic large and catastrophic uh, fires across Australia. So in the last two years, we've had a, a number of events like this. 
where almost the entire Australian continent was above 40 degrees. That was unheard of. A lot of it is above 45 degrees. We had droughts at the same time as flooding rainfall. And of course, we had one of the worst bushfire seasons ever, widespread across Australia, with huge areas of land burnt, lots of impact on people, lots of impact on um, the biodiversity, you know, with estimates of over a billion animals having died. It occurred in every state, and it was due to this combination of intense heat waves and drought, basically causing, you know, severe fire weather. I think the sad part is that there's been, there was reports on this, scientific predictions, basically, that we would start seeing catastrophic fire weather by about 2020, and that report was like 15 years ago, basically spot on, it's been happening. I think this is a, the, the, everyone will remember what happened in the Murray-Darling, what was now about 18 months ago, two years ago, um, where basically there was a massive, millions of fish died in the river all in one go. And this was a great example of some of the things of the sort of event that I guess climate change biologists have been warning people about for a long time, because it's not just temperature, it's how these, all of these different changes in the environment actually interact with each other. Now, this was a system where there was already um, poor management, low environmental water flow because of over extraction and because of climate change enhanced drought. So that led to poor water quality. Then there was a record breaking heat wave of about 47 degrees for a number of days, which caused a blue green algae outbreak in the river. And then the heat wave ended and the temperature dropped overnight by 25 degrees, which caused massive mixing of the water column, which resulted in a bacterial bloom, eating uh, all the dead algae, removed all the oxygen, and that killed all the fish. And so that was sort of, it's a sort of a very sad, but it's a great example of the kind of compounded events that we're talking about with the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. Um, in, the, in this latest IPCC report, if you look just at the, our region, the sort of northern part of Australia, we're changing temperature roughly about the same as the global average. We've had increased uh, rainfall though, decrease in drought, and that's likely to increase into the middle of the century with sort of medium confidence. So they're starting to get more confident about those rainfall predictions. Possibly a decline in cyclone frequency and an increase in the severity of those cyclones, but again, that's lower confidence. But really confidently, heat waves uh, have increased, are uh, continuing to increase. And in a lot of the region, we're going to be going from something like you know, no, none to three days above 40 degrees per year as, a, as an average to up to 40 days per year above 40 degrees. So a massive increase in future heat wave extreme events in the region. So, you know, where we are here, we're sitting right between two really amazing world heritage areas, as everyone's very well aware in this room. Um, and we've all heard for a long time now about the impacts on the reef. And the last three bleaching events have been extremely severe and a huge proportion of the reef has been um, really badly damaged. Of course, my interest has been in the tropical rainforest. Uh, that's what I did my PhD on. That's what I've worked on basically my whole life. Um, all up and down the wet tropics rainforest. And I mean, it's an amazing area. It's basically considered to be the second most significant world heritage area globally because of the high and unique biodiversity in the region, the really unique um, species here. It's got a lot of really distinct in terms of evolution, evolutionarily distinct taxa. Okay, so <clears throat> what's going to happen to systems like this and what's already happening? Over the last 20 years in global change biology, there's been lots of studies mostly predicting what's going to happen, including myself. I put this graph up a lot because this is actually what started me working at climate change. Never intended to work on climate change. I was just working on rainforest ecology and you know, looking at possums and birds and stuff. 
And I did this analysis way back, 2003, so like almost 20 years ago, and it basically showed this predicted extinction curve up here and essentially saying almost everything I worked on was going to go extinct this century. And that changed the direction of everything I've done in terms of my research since then. There's been a lot of studies that have looked at global patterns. So back in 2004, prediction about a third of all species might go extinct. More recently, 2015, I think this one was 2015 or 16, 2015, predicted a little bit less, about 15% of all species potentially going extinct. However, that, that particular paper, I think, was really underestimated a lot of the high endemism areas. Like if you look at here, there's only four studies in the entirety of the Asian region right down through this mega diverse area and only seven in South America. I actually think that particular paper is quite, un, is quite severely underestimating the impacts. Since then, there's been a lot. You can search them up. There's literally hundreds of papers looking at impacts of climate change on biodiversity. They've done it in using completely, you know, lots of different approaches, lots of different taxa, uh, lots of different regions, um, but all predict serious biodiversity loss. And pretty much coming to, most of them coming into the conclusion that climate change was likely to become the most significant impact that we're facing globally and outstripping uh, the previously um, most severe effect, which was obviously habitat loss. Now, this is particularly worrying to us here in the tropics because now there's a lot of evidence saying that tropical species are mostly thermal specialists and they're highly vulnerable oh, yeah. to changes in temperature. And a lot of people have talked about this over the years, over the last 20 years. Um, mountain ecosystems with high endemism, just like the wet tropics, are particularly vulnerable. Most of the species have a fairly narrow range of um, environmental tolerances and um, a low degree of variability in temperature. So about 10 years ago, we made predictions like this. Now, keep in mind, this is just a prediction. This was just based on predicting the future based on species distribution models. And the predictions then, a lot of data went into this, a lot of field work, but basically it was sort of saying that about half of all species in the region are likely to go extinct or become at least critically endangered this century. And a lot of others would be vulnerable and a very few species would be okay. So I guess now the question is another 10 years on from those analyses, what are we actually seeing? Well, globally, this review paper a couple of years ago basically showed that in almost every ecosystem in the world, species were already moving. In marine, in terrestrial, in birds, in plants, in insects, in vertebrates, everything, species are already moving with the change in climate. Here in the wet tropics, uh, that's where my study sites have been for the last 20 odd years. Um, basically, in all of those mountain ranges, we sample as much as we can across the available elevational gradient, because that's basically temperature, and we can get an idea of what changes are across that temperature gradient. And done lots of standardised biodiversity surveys on a whole range of taxonomic groups um, across most of those sites in the region. And so now we've got a really good baseline data set. We have got a very good idea of the spatial pattern of biodiversity in the region in terms of species richness, of the patterns of endemism, and even you know, things like the patterns of evolutionary distinctiveness within the region, where are the hotspots, these different measures of biodiversity. We know how that changes across elevation. We know that um, the diversity increases up into the uplands, depending on which taxonomic group you look at, the shape of that curve might change a little bit. But basically a, bio, a, a fauna that is in the uplands, that's the important bit. So we've got a fauna that We've now got, got a lot of studies showing that there is that there's evidence of direct influence of temperature on these species. We know this is an old study that I did with Jeff Middleton here. Um, 
We know that the severity of the dry season has a big influence on a lot of species, and that's another thing that's predicted to increase in this region is the severity of the dry season. So basically, we're in a highly vulnerable system. And any of you who have seen my talks in the past have probably seen me put up a figure like this where we've got the distribution of a species. We've done this for all of the vertebrate species. And we can look at what happens to that species as the temperature changes. And that's a prediction of what would happen to a golden bowbird. Now, again, that was a prediction 10 years ago. And we could come up with a list of what we thought were the most vulnerable species in the region. Um, and because I'm talking about birds at the moment, you can see there's six birds on that list, again, based on those predictions from about 2010. Okay, so what actually has been happening since then? So um, the latest paper that we've, it's actually only available as a preprint at the moment, it's still in the review process, but you can actually look at it as a preprint. Um, we've analysed these patterns of the rainforest birds. And basically the aim is to take all of my standardised bird survey data over those years and see whether things are changing, whether species are declining, whether they're expanding, whether they're moving up the mountain as predicted um, 10 years ago. Now, one of the problems that we ran into was that when you start analysing what's happening to a species in a mountain system across an elevational gradient, is that not all species do the same thing. They all vary a lot. Um, it depends on, you know, the spatial scale of what you're looking at, how long the analysis is based on, and what part of the elevational gradient you're examining. That's a really important one because every species is different across that elevational gradient. And so you could see, be seeing a change in a species at one elevation, but no change in another elevation. And that's perfectly understandable given its distribution across elevation. And there's some examples there just to illustrate that. So something like a yellow spotted honey eater, most abundant in the lowlands. So as the temperature warms, you'd say, okay, well, I'm not really sure what's going to happen to them in the lowlands because I don't have any warmer place to make, base my predictions on. So you sort of predict, okay, well, maybe we don't really know, maybe no change. But you would make the prediction that if it's related to temperature, that they would start to increase in abundance at, hot, at the higher part of their range. Something like a catbird, which is actually most abundant in the middle, you might not be too sure what's going on, going on here for a few years, but you would make the prediction that it should start to decline down the bottom, lower elevation, and it should start to increase in the higher elevations. Something like a mountain thornbill, not too sure what's going to happen right at the top of its range, but you would certainly predict that it should start declining in the lower parts of its range. Now, the problem with that complexity, I guess, is that you can't just say a species has declined at this place and the entire species has declined. Or even if you get something where there's no change in the total population size, something like this, if you had an equal increase here and an equal decrease here, your ind index of change in total population size might be that it hasn't changed at all. So you'd be tempted to say, hey, climate change is not affecting that species. But if you think of that pattern there, it's strongly affecting the species, but equally to different parts of its range. And there's a whole lot of things associated with sampling biases that you've got to take into account. So basically it takes a lot of data to be able to do this. Um, so we ended up using a program called TRIM, which is specifically designed to look at trends in bird populations over time, exactly what we were trying to do. And we had to look at, you know, which, which bird species we actually had enough data to do this for. We had to have reliable data that, you know, I trusted the identification of the birds. We had to have data across the whole elevation range. We had to have data for that species of bird most years for the last 20 years. So that started to restrict our subset of species that we could do that for. We ended up with 42 species of birds where we had good enough data across that time to do these analyses. Some of the examples, something like toothbill bowbird, massive decline, probably about a 60% decline of the total population uh, across the region. Um, Bower shrike thrush, an even greater decline in total population across the region. But then there was these other species that had these complicated patterns. So something like a fern wren, for about the first seven or eight years, they actually were increasing in abundance. 
Since then, for the last 10 years, they've been systematically declining. But if you actually looked at what the estimate of total population size is now, it's basically about the same as it was 20 years ago. So you could, again, you could look at that data and say, hey, fern wrens are just fine. You know, they're, they're exactly the same population size as they were 20 years ago. The fact is, though, that I would look at that and say, well, they increased because they actually moved into larger areas of the forest. Since then, they've been systematically declining as the temperatures increase, and that trend is very likely to continue. So I would say that they are very much in trouble. Um, similarly, Mount Thornbills have done something similar, but pretty messily, sort of species that we haven't really been able to tell a huge amount about. You start to get more power in the analysis when you start to combine all of the species together to look for sort of broader combined patterns across the bird fauna. If you look at the total abundance of just all rainforest birds, it hasn't changed too much. There actually is a slight decline, but nothing too dramatic. If you look at the species that are habitat generalists in the region, by habitat generalists, I mean they use they're not just rainforest specialists, they use a whole range of habitats. They seem to increase quite a lot, but then seem to have been declining again. But when you start looking at the regionally endemic species, let's face it, these are the species we actually care the most about because these are the, the reason that the World Heritage Area was put in place to protect. They have declined by about 40% on average, 30 to 40%. And similarly, if you look at rainforest specialists, they have also declined by about 20 odd percent on average across the region. So very worrying declines, very severe declines. And of course, as I said, it's the endemic species that, you know, in terms of the World Heritage Area that we're really most concerned about. And on average, they've declined by 30% already. And look, so then to look at um, what's happening in different parts of the elevational uh, gradient, if we look at lowland species, so species that we would classify as being, you know, predominantly found in high abundance in the lowlands, they've increased dramatically up to nearly 200%, but on average about 150 odd percent. Species that used to be in the midlands, like they say, like the catbird that I mentioned, mostly on average they've declined by about 20% with a lot of variation. But the upland species that were restricted to the higher elevations, they're the ones that have had the most dramatic decline. Now that's all pretty much exactly what you would predict based on increasing temperature, if temperature was going to be the driver of change. The other thing is like, how are they moving? So if you just look at lowland species, well, in the lowlands, so lowland species in the lowlands have actually increased a little bit at the moment by about 15, 17% roughly. Lowland species in the midlands have almost doubled. So basically the mid elevations, like up at around about 600, these lowland species have doubled their density up in those mid, mid elevations. Species that were midland species have declined by almost 50%, like about 40% in the lowlands. So in the hotter part of their range, they've declined dramatically. In the midlands, they've declined. In the uplands, they've still been relatively stable. So keeping in mind, these are species which this is kind of was their core habitat. Now it's more stable in the uplands. The species that were the high elevation species have declined everywhere dramatically. And so this has been termed in the literature, the escalator to extinction. Basically species getting pushed up mountains, like on an escalator, there's nowhere to go at the top of the mountain, except to go extinct. And um, this is kind of a graphical representation, sorry, pictorial representation of that data, where sort of lowland species are increasing in the up in the midlands, midland species have declined and upland species, the blue ones here have declined dramatically over about 16 years. So um, we've combined with uh, Stephen Garnett and people from BirdLife. Um, so a lot of the species that are on this list, which are now going to get listed with this in the, um, threatened status of vulnerable, endangered, near threatened and so on. The new recommendations that are coming out in the um, Action Plan for Australian Birds is not just based on 
the data I just showed you, it's actually to be listed on here, it has to be corroborated by other independent uh, observations as well. And so something like an example of that is where the toothful bow bird, where my data would actually suggest it should be listed as endangered, but the recommendation is only near threatened. And that's simply because there's been a couple of other places where uh, they hadn't noticed a decline in toothbills. Unfortunately, when we look at that data, it's in places that my data would predict that you wouldn't get declines. It's at, it's at an elevation that you would predict that they wouldn't have declined yet. And in fact, there's been a couple of other data sets come to light since the nominations have gone in, which are much more in line with uh, my data. So I really think that the tooth build should have been at least vulnerable and probably endangered. Okay, so the other group that I've talked a lot about in the past is the ring tail possums. Again, it was a group that over the years we've made lots of uh, predictions about what might happen to them. These are some of the predictions for lemuroid ringtails, Turbot River ringtails and greens. You can see that the different IPCC scenarios there all are predicted to severely decline. Um, and there's an example of what has actually happened on one of my sites. Um, where we're looking at the observed abundance based on spotlight, standardised spotlighting surveys at one site, and, and this site, which is at 800 metres down in Wurrunurin, um, is probably the place that had the highest abundance of lemuroids almost anywhere in the region. Um, and you can see that they've undergone a very significant decline over the last 10 years. And similarly, not quite as dramatically, Herbert River ringtails have disappeared from the lower parts at 600 metres. They're declining at 700 metres. They're now starting to decline at 800. Up at 1,000 metres, they seem to be still relatively stable. Green ringtails actually have increased in the higher elevations. They never used to be present very commonly up at like 1,000 metres. Um, in fact, one of my sites that I started sampling very early on in the early 90s I never saw green ringtails there for the first six or seven years of monitoring it. And then they appeared and then they actually increased in abundance, but they sort of peaked again. They sort of increased for about seven or eight years. And in the last 10 years, they've been sort of declining a bit at that high elevation site. Don't tree ringtails have increased into the lowlands because they were a much more lower elevation species. So what are we doing about that? Well, we've started a few new projects. Um, I've started a PhD, Alejandro de la Fuente, who um, has turned out to be a, an outstanding PhD student. They've done some fantastic work. Um, we've started a project monitoring the possums in association with Wetmar and Queensland Parks and Wildlife, where we're basically trying to increase the number of monitoring sites and we're training the rangers to go out and monitor those same sites and you know, increase the amount of data, um, see what's happening. And we started a project uh, with the guys from Agriculture who are sitting all over there at the moment, um, where we're on their land up behind um, Lake Morris over at uh, the base of the Lamb Range there, where we're doing biodiversity surveys. Again, training these guys to do biodiversity surveys on their land and um, hopefully you know, getting some important monitoring data on culturally significant species up there as well. And so sort of trying to increase the sampling into different areas that we haven't sampled before, getting more involvement with different stakeholder groups um, and seeing um, what's going on on those areas. So summarising that, the biodiversity of the region um, is already disappearing. It's not, not something we're predicting anymore into the future. We've already got massive impacts already happening. So what are we doing right now? Um, as I said, a lot of this is due, uh, work that I'll show you now is due to two uh, new PhD students, or well, not so much new, that are current PhD students, I should say, Alejandro and Lily Lay. Um, and what we're trying to do is really get a better understanding of what's driving those declines in some places, and also what factors might alleviate those declines. And the way that we're doing that is basically adding into those models important drivers of abundance, not just the climate, like in those earlier estimates. We're getting much better estimates of environmental extremes. As I was saying, they're really important to include extremes, not just the change in the means. 
and also including biotic interactions with a um, collaboration with some guys doing uh, biotic network analysis down in Adelaide uh, with Corey Bradshaw's group. And so one of the main things we're trying to do is take records of species, turn that into a distribution map, which we can predict abundance with, because abundance is a much more powerful tool than just a, a map of where they occur. Now, we started doing this uh, back in 2009, uh, where we're taking this sort of species distribution models and trying to predict local population abundance. Um, we put out a paper back in 2009 with Jeremy Vanderweil, and what we found was that we could explain a small amount of the variation in low abundance, but we could actually explain really quite well the maximum abundance. So basically, climate was a limiting variable on abundance, but there was a huge amount of variation that we weren't explaining. So now Alejandro has been um, trying to improve on those estimates. Now, one of the things that's really important, I said, is environmental extremes, so temperature extremes. Now, a lot of the models only include things like temperature minimums, maximums, and averages. That doesn't take into account how long a heat wave goes, for example, and that's what can really drive the environmental stress. Um, we talked about this a long time ago in terms of dry season severity, where we made the point that in terms of understanding bird abundance, you really had to consider the length of the dry season as well as the severity of the dry season. So basically how big the area is here to understand how that affects the biodiversity. And we showed back then that that area basically explained lower numbers of insects in the rainforest and that that low um, bottleneck in insect abundance during the dry season was one of the best predictors of bird abundance. So Alejandro is sort of taking that approach uh, and trying to understand what's going on with the ring-tail possums. So trying to improve our understanding, improve our sort of what is really driving these declines. So that's his PhD research and he's basically using much better uh, more up-to-date statistical modelling techniques for this. He's got access to more data because he's got my entire data set and we're continuing to collect data with the parks guys, with the agriculture guys and on our own sites. And really importantly, we're including that spatially and temporal stress measures, thermal stress. But then also including physiological mechanisms of feeding ecology and nutrition and soil nutrients and how that all links up. Um, and also because Alejandro is much smarter than me. So one of the first things he's doing is including in the analysis soil fertility, how that affects the food resources and how that interrupts, interrelates with temperature. Now, a lot of people in the past have actually talked about how soil fertility affects herbivores. Uh, in fact, John Kanowski, back exactly 20 years ago, talked about how the soil fertility in the region had a direct influence on the abundance of ring-tailed possums. Uh, in the Amazon, it affects the abundance of primates. What Alejandro is doing is getting down, delving down into the actual physiological mechanism for that and looking at something called the detoxification limitation hypothesis. And that's where these possums, they're eating leaves and the leaves are full of toxins. So they eat them for a small amount of time and then they reach a limit and then they have to stop eating and let their body deal with those toxins, let it decline, and then they can start eating again. If they continue to eat them, they'll actually go over the toxification threshold and it can actually lead to poisoning. So that's to do with the nutritional quality of the leaves that they're eating. Now we also know that thermal stress, the possums die at above about 28 to 30 degrees. And that's some work by Andrew Krockenberger here in Cairns. And we know that possums, you can see here the abundance, I think this is green ring tails, really drops off once the maximum temperature gets above 30 degrees. So we know that there's thermal intolerance as well. What Alejandro is doing is taking the idea that it's not just that maximum temperature, but it's this, it's looking at how hot does it get during the year taking the threshold predicted by the physiology and looking at how long is the period that it's above that threshold. And so basically integrating 
that area is an index of thermal stress. So it's now taking into account not just how hot it is, but for how long it is across the entire year. And then doing that for every pixel, every part of the region. So you can get basically a, a spatially explicit layer of thermal stress that's related to this function. The overall hypothesis that he's working on and understanding the possums is in here, which is basically the climate change influences the temperature, which influences the physiology of the possums in terms of their body temperature, their water availability. That interacts with their feeding rate because there's an interaction between the toxins, as I talked about, the water availability, and how much they can ingest before they um, uh, get poisoned. The feeding rate is determined by the foliage quality. So what he's doing is collecting leaf samples and analyzing them for nutrient quality, and then collecting soil samples at the same sites to actually find out the relationship between the soil, the foliage, and then directly into the um, feeding rate and the estimating the population size. So, you know, really getting into the mechanisms rather than just the pattern. What he's been able to do is take this very poor explanatory power analysis that we did 10 years ago and turn it into something that is actually much, much better at explaining patterns of local abundance. Going from only explaining 12% of the deviation to 55%. And in fact, for the possums, it's way better than herbivores. It actually explains 72%. So in other words, we're now getting a really good relationship between those environmental predictors and the abundance of possums, which we can then use for all sorts of analyses and um, spatial planning. And that's a sort of an example of that resistant surface where you're looking at the thermal stress based on the physiological responses of the possum and um, the actual habitat. So this is on the Atherton Tableland. You can see all the cleared areas, Bartle, Freer, Bellin and Kerr, and the degree of resistance in um, thermal stress. The other thing that he's done, which is really cool, is um, taking that sort of high resolution thermal stress data, adding it to all of our previous species distribution models and so on, and then looking at not only how species will decline in the future in terms of their total abundance, but actually looking at each local population and where it can actually shift to in the environment and how good that place will be, whether or not it will be able to survive there and whether or not populations will actually go extinct. And what it shows is that depending on the climate change scenario is that there's going to be a huge threshold impact in the uplands with a rapidly increasing rate of local population extinctions. And that's across all of the vertebrates, not just the possums. So, <clears throat> you know, we're really improving our knowledge of the mechanisms behind these declines as well as being able to make, so that enables us to make much better predictions, more robust predictions, and use that in any sort of planning and adaptation that we might want to do. Um, what time should I be finishing, Bill? Oh, it's been the five quarter Right, so I'm already, I'm already pushing my envelope. Um, the other area that I'll, I'll very quickly skim through is our boreality. It's, it's a really cool um, part of the story, and that's that uh, this started out with a former student and then postdoc of mine, Brett Sheffers, looking at how species that can go up into the canopy are more resilient to climate change. And so very quickly, he did a whole lot of papers. And the idea is that up in the canopy, it's a very different environment to down on the ground. I'll just skip through that because I'm running out of time and jump, jump through to the conclusion here sort of thing. And what that analysis shows is that in places that have been really stable, so in other words, the upland stable refugia, when I say stable, they've been stable climatically and stable rainforest places over the last hundred or so thousand years. What they have is a fairly normal distribution of species that are arboreal. In other words, that go up into the trees. And it's not different to what you might expect from random. But a lot of the rest of the wet tropics has been less stable. So the climate has fluctuated a lot more. And what has happened is that the more stable, sorry, the more unstable it has been, the more the community is dominated by arboreal species. And so what that's suggesting is that arboreal species are more resilient, they're less restricted by elevational barriers, 
And by in inference, they're, they're likely to be more resilient to climate change. And um, I've got PhD student Lily, who's been testing a lot of those ideas as well, uh, using ant, and she's been climbing lots of trees, looking at the temperature in the trees, looking at how the canopy varies, looking at how the ant community varies from the ground up into the canopy, and showing, I'll just skip to the conclusions. She's also looked at the physiology, so taking it another further step, she's actually tested the physiology of a lot of the species to make sure that these ideas are actually, you know, grounded in the physiology of the ant. And basically, oh, I'm going to skip through this. That although cold tolerance uh, does change across elevation, the heat tolerance doesn't. So basically, as you go up the mountain, the ants don't lose any heat tolerance. That's just basis, um, based on their phylogeny of being ants. But the species that climb trees have a much broader thermal tolerance. They're more of a thermal generalist than the species on the ground. Species of ants on the ground have a narrow temperature range. They're thermal specialists and therefore much more um, variable from place to place across the elevation gradient. Now, so what she's actually found, she's published most of this work already. She's also looked at the uh, difference between the ant communities during the day and at night. And again, I'm gonna skip through this. I talked to you much at the start. Um, basically, I guess the take home message from all of her work on the ants is that basically confirms the earlier work that we did on vertebrates, that if you are a species that can utilize that three dimensional gradient within the forest, you can climb up the trees, you're likely to have a higher temperature tolerance, be more generalist, you'd be more resilient to temperature changes, and they tend to have a broader distributional range in the region as well. And so it's an important variable to consider when we're talking about understanding vulnerability. And I'll skip through that. And I'll leave, finish with this nice little cartoon, which I really like. I mean, everyone in the whole world has been concerned about COVID in recent years and the economic recession that's associated with COVID. And I think um, that little wave there has hidden our view um, of a much larger wave that is coming our way and, you know, was, uh, was always coming before COVID, but now we can't see it as clearly. And I guess what I've been trying to emphasise is that that climate change has a huge impact on the world's biodiversity, driving potentially a massive biodiversity collapse. And if that actually happens, well, then that little dark wave you can see coming in the background there would really drive complete social, environmental and economic collapse. Um, so I really think that we need to forget a little bit about COVID and concentrate on these larger issues and I'll leave it there. Thanks.